What's up, YouTube? Firing things up for actually, I guess, high Spotify as well. Let's uh, let's get this show on the road, huh? You're listening to the Back Home Network, presented by Homefield Apparel. Welcome back to Crimson Cast. Galen Clavio joining you. It's Friday, May 17th, and it's the year 2024. Can't believe we're already more than halfway through May. Summer already flying by, and I'm not happy about it. But we're going to try to make the most of what we've got. It has been raining nonstop in Bloomington this whole week, which has really gotten annoying. But hopefully better weather next week. No, it's going to rain even more. Uh, at this point, I think we're just hoping that the weather for the 500 calms down, evens out a little bit. We'll see what happens. Anyway, got a lot to tackle today as we've got a lot of different things going on. We're going to talk a little bit about the most recent signing for IU men's basketball. We're going to talk about some of the issues going on in college sports as that situation continues to spiral. And we're learning that a lot of the media coverage about it is probably not accurate enough to really bank on. We'll talk about that in a second. We've also got some questions from our folks on Instagram as I asked for some questions and you folks provided them. So I'm going to tackle all that here in a minute. But first of all, just a reminder, we're part of the Back Home Network here on Crimson Cast. And the Back Home Network is brought to you collectively by Home Field Apparel, your place to go for the finest in college fashion and more. As we've seen Home Field Apparel dropping some tremendous racing content over the course of this spring. If you missed it, they just dropped a McLaren collection, which looks amazing. They had an Indy 500 collection that they dropped a few weeks earlier. And then, of course, they had the little 500 collection that they dropped earlier on this spring. It all fits into the tremendous array of things that Homefield offers you from an apparel perspective, everything from T-shirts to crewnecks, to long sleeve tees, to baseball tees, to hoodies, to hats. It's it's essentially an entire department store, but in website form. And you can go check it out yourself. Go to homefieldapparel.com, follow them on Instagram, follow them on Twitter, and you can get 15% off your first order if you use the code HOME23. HOME23, get 15% off your first order. Also, a reminder that Homefield's going to be doing an event in Speedway on Friday of next week, on, on Carb Day, basically. Uh, in Speedway, they're going to have the shutdown full cast guys. Uh, they're doing a live podcast. Um, they've got a racing expert coming in to be on the podcast. Should be a lot of fun. I'll be up there if anybody's going to uh, be around. Would love to see you there. So again, check that out. Tickets, I believe, still available. Should be a great time. Starts at 5 o'clock. On Friday, go to homefieldapparel.com and find out more information. Also, just a reminder, we are on Substack here on Crimson Cast. It is crimsoncast.substack.com. We try to keep it simple for everybody. Get emails about the podcast delivered right to your inbox. That way you don't have to go searching through the wilds of, of Twitter or places like that. Um, we also try to stuff some extra things into the newsletters. We occasionally have links. I put some links in from the last podcast that I did that you could check out. We've also got a VIP section where we will send extra things to our subscribers. We've, we've uh, got a couple of VIP videos coming up here relatively soon. Uh, should have one this weekend from Scott and myself as we're back uh, podcasting again in a couple of days, which is obviously something I'm looking forward to. So uh, go to crimsoncast.substack.com, sign up for free. We'd love to have you part of the community. Join the over 850 people that have already subscribed and join the over 6,000 people that are part of the Back Home Network audience on YouTube. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's just Back Home Network. You can find it very easily. All right. First thing that we wanted to tackle today, uh, some updates on Bloomington restaurants for those of you who are around and or thinking about coming to Bloomington. Uh, we all have a variety of places that we generally like to go. One of the things I note when I'm talking to people is, you know, everybody kind of falls into the the pattern of going to the same places that were popular when they were in school. And while I understand that, 
I think it's important to keep in mind there's always new things that pop up in Bloomington. Those are normally good places to go. Uh, we did get the rather sad announcement, for those who haven't heard, that the Irish Lion is allegedly going to be going to a delivery-only service. It really does look like that place is, is maybe closing for good. Uh, it's been kind of touch and go this week as far as how long the kitchen's going to stay open. Um, we know that Irish Lion's been up for sale for a little while, and it looks like this may unfortunately be the end of the line for it. Uh, 42 years, I think, in the Bloomington community, and certainly for a lot of folks out there in the audience, one of the favorite places for a lot of you to go in the 80s and 90s especially. So uh, we'll keep tabs on that and let you know what's going on there. Some other things uh, to keep in mind from a restaurant perspective in town, if you haven't uh, stopped and tried any of them, um, some I've, I've touched on some of the individual restaurants. We talked about the Elm last time. We've talked about C3. Um, some interesting thing go, going on in the hamburger space in Bloomington. Um, for those who haven't been to Buffalo Louis in a while, they've changed their hamburger approach. They've now gone to the smash burger model as opposed to the kind of pub burger model that they used to have. I personally really enjoyed the change. I think that the uh, Buffalo Louis smash burgers are very good and uh, they kind of add a different texture and taste to their already very good burger menu. I've, I've long been an advocate of the Sweet Lou burger at Buffalo's and, and now in smash burger form, I think it actually tastes even better. Uh, and now one of a number of places in town that have gone the smash burger route, uh, obviously Fat Dan's, I think does it probably, you know, as good, if not better than anybody else in town. And I believe Trojan Horse has gone to that as well, although I haven't been since they've made that shift. Uh, on the pub burger front, you've now got a brew burger open in Bloomington at the corner of Third and Grant, and, and that area is getting a little busier. They've renovated that whole strip. Uh, they had to do some like uh, pollution mitigation where that laundromat used to be on Third Street, but they've pulled that out. And there's a Pizza X there now, formerly Pizza Express, for those of you who were around in the 90s and 2000s. And across the street, there's a Brew Burger. And the Brew Burger is very good. If you haven't been to Brew Burger in Indianapolis or, or the suburbs, it's worth checking out. Uh, so that's open. That opened a, a couple of months ago and, and seems to be going strong. And for those who haven't been to Kirkwood in a while, just kind of a little update on what's going on there. Uh, I think most of you know this if you've been back to Bloomington any time in the last four years. But Lenny's, which used to be at 10th uh, Street across from Ashton Quad, has now moved in to where the Den slash Finches, slash, I forget what Finches was called before it was called Finches, used to be. Um, so that's become a pretty uh, regularly attended place for, for those people who like going to Lenny's on a regular basis for lunch, which is most of the university uh, faculty and academic community. There's a Raising Canes now, uh, where basically right next to where the Chipotle is on Kirkwood. And I believe those are all the major changes. Oh, there's also an Ever Bowl, which opened up uh, on the second floor uh, of where Lenny's is at, uh, which is, if you remember, if you remember where La Bamba's used to be on the second floor, that side of things is, is actually the second floor of Lenny's. But then on the other side of it, where Campus Candy was for a while, that's where the Ever Bowl is located. So all good places worth checking out. Just wanted to give a little update on some of the things going on. In Bloomington, we did have a question. I can't pop these questions up on the screen for those of you watching. And by the way, if you're just listening to this podcast, we do have video versions of these that you can now watch. Uh, you can go to YouTube, go to the Back Home Network channel, check out um, the, the videos on YouTube. Also on Spotify, you can watch the videos as opposed to or watch the podcast as opposed to just listen to them. But we did have a question. Why do small breweries seem to struggle here in Bloomington? And why is the answer we need a Metazoa model? Which I had to ask what the Metazoa model was just, just for clarification purposes. And uh, I was I was reminded that, you know, essentially that just means that you can have dogs at all times and that there's a dog park built in. I love the idea of a brewery with a dog park here in Bloomington. I do think we need that. Um, you know, the, the the serious answer, I guess, as far as why small breweries struggle here is I think actually the reason why a lot of restaurants struggle in Bloomington, which is that the first of all, the two months of the year when the students aren't here, really it's more like two and a half months from like the beginning of May until the middle of August, that is a killer time from a financial perspective because the dirty little secret about Bloomington, I don't think I'm 
breaking any news here, even to the people who live in town, is that Bloomington people don't go out that much. There's there's some that do, but the vast the, for the number of people that live in Bloomington that aren't students, you know, so you're probably talking about somewhere between sixty and seventy thousand people. They don't go out that much, and um, that's been the case for a long time. And it's interesting because a lot of times you'll hear complaints from locals about how downtown has changed so much and how it's so student oriented. And, and that's true. A lot of the restaurants that have been built uh, are based upon the apartment complexes that are downtown. A lot of the retail that is now in the downtown area is based upon the apartment complexes that were built. And the thing to keep in mind is that when those apartments are empty, there's really not a lot of people frequenting the downtown because there's still a bunch of people who don't like paying for parking. They switched over to a metered uh, pay parking model several years ago in downtown Bloomington. And many people use that as an excuse to not go uh, and 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 patron the, uh, patronize the places downtown. So uh, part of the issue, I think, is just there's not enough business for the number of local breweries that there are. I mean, think about it. There are quite a few places that have either been open or are still open that are making their own beer. You've obviously got Upland, which has multiple locations. You've got the Tap, uh, which services both the Tap and and the other, uh, you know, Finney Property Group uh, restaurants, whether that's Social Cantina or Smokeworks or Yogi's. You've got uh, Metalworks now, which used to, well, it was it was, it was uh, function, and then it was Metalworks, and and they've now are under new ownership. You've got Lenny's, which is BBC. You've got Big Woods, which while there's not the brewery right downtown, it's obviously right down the road in Nashville. Um, you had Switchyard, which was open until just recently. I mean, you had a lot of places. And you, then you got to add in Cardinal, which isn't a brewer, but it's a distiller. I just think that there's a little bit too much going on here. Like there, and, and all of the places, uh, they're, they're all to some degree offering a similar kind of vibe and environment. And I think that it's to some degree the idea that, hey, let's have a dog-friendly place that's open all the time. There, there's some... Uh, there's some validity to that idea in as much as you've got to be able to draw people that live in Bloomington and the surrounding areas in consistently. And I don't know that there's enough market differentiation to be able to do that. I also, you know, at the end of the day, I just don't think there's enough people and breweries, you, know, you can't rely on students the same way that you would rely on adults, but you don't have the number of adults to be able to rely on like you have in larger metropolitan areas or places where there's only one brewery and everybody goes there. So it's, it's unfortunate. And the same thing affects restaurants and we've seen restaurants close. Irish lion is closing. Why? Uh, you know, to some degree, it's a bit of the same thing I was just talking about this idea that the lion for many people was an iconic venue. It was one of the places that you first started going after you either became of age or, acquired a document that claimed you were of that age, even if you weren't actually. Uh, you know, when I was a college student in Bloomington, there weren't a lot of places downtown. I mean, there was Nick's, uh, there was the Lion, there was Crazy Horse, and there were a few other places sprinkled around, but the, the, the it wasn't the same level of competition in the downtown area. And you think about the huge number of places that have opened up in the downtown area because of the apartments and because of the reorganization of downtown. And I think it's just a different business model. So uh, that would be my take on all of that. But, you know, there, there's always room for new ideas. And I think you need innovation in the marketplace because people have got to make a decision. Like, I want to go have X, Y, and Z. And with the number of options, especially when the students aren't here, I mean, there's there's only so many times you're going to go out a week. And what's going to draw you in as a consumer? That ends up being the big question mark. Anyway, uh if you've got questions about the Bloomington food scene, we're, we'll do a full episode or two of this coming up soon. We'll actually tackle that same question uh, with some of our Bloomington food review panel, hopefully here in the next few weeks. We're trying to get the band back together for that. So keep keep an eye out for that. Anyway, let's go to issue two, Langdon Hatton. Welcome to the IU family, Langdon Hatton. This is, of course, for those who are not familiar, this is the new transfer that Indiana pulled in this week. Uh, Langdon Hatton, according to IU Artifacts, the first ever native of Georgetown, Indiana, uh, to become an Indiana basketball player, put on an Indiana uniform. So 
what is the story with Langdon Hatton and what is the story overall in terms of where Indiana is at with their roster? So let's start off by looking at Hatton's statistics. Uh, so if I call up his Ken Palm page here, you can see that Hatton is a player who you know doesn't jump off the page, at least in terms of like being a, a dominant star, played for a really bad Bellarmine team this last year. But I think it's worth noting, if you look at Hatton, who started his career at William & Mary and then spent two years at Bellarmine, he did some things that were notable on the national scene last year from a purely statistical perspective. And you know, this is always the thing, like when you look at this type of player, a player who is going to provide depth, round out the roster, maybe be able to put in five to 10 minutes on a given night when needed, this from a statistical profile, looks like the type of player that would be good to have in that spot. 6'10", 240 pounds, uh, played a bunch of minutes last year, was was more efficient than not in terms of his overall offensive performance, was a very good rebounder. I mean, ranked 252nd nationally in defensive rebounding percentage and ranked 463rd in offensive rebounding percentage, didn't turn the ball over very much, provided some rim protection at a good block percentage, and didn't foul a lot. Uh, you know, was not shooting the ball perhaps at a level that you would like to see, only shot 51% from two, which is a little bit small for a big man, but still 68% from the free throw line, which is decent. Um, you know, wasn't afraid to shoot a three every once in a while, took 45 last year. And, you know, when I look at this player, what I'm looking at is – who can provide that extra amount of time off the bench, middle part of the first half, when Omar Balo or Malik Renu needs a breather? This looks like the type of player that can come in and fill that role and be pretty comfortable doing it. And, you know, native Hoosier, you know, a player that I'm sure, you know, would is excited to put on the Indiana uniform. And, you know, this is not a player that is likely to play a huge number of minutes. And you don't need that. I mean, the, the whole idea that you really need to be thinking about from a basketball perspective is if you've got your stars, if you've got the players, you're going to play the majority of minutes. You have to have some complementary pieces, players that are going to role play effectively. And you can be able to say to that player, look, your role is to come in and do X, Y, and Z, and we can't really promise you anything else. And even if you play really well, you're still probably just going to have that role. And there's a lot of teams, a lot of very successful teams that are able to rely on players like that and having players that are happy with their roles, having players that can come in and contribute and give their best during that time period. That is what you're looking for. So, you know, from that perspective, assuming that Langdon Hatton can come in and provide that, this looks like a really good pickup for Indiana because they didn't need another starter caliber player. What they needed was somebody who could come in and provide some degree of consistency in terms of coming off the bench. You know, you look at what they got last year from Peyton Sparks, who, who very much filled this role. I think it's worth noting that Sparks really never looked comfortable in the role. He only played about 13% of available minutes. And what was unfortunate was a lot of the things that we saw out of Peyton Sparks at Ball State in that second year just never really translated. I mean, Sparks looked much better statistically than Langdon Hatton looks on paper coming into this year. Uh, Sparks was a better shooter. Sparks was a better rebounder on both ends of the floor. Sparks was just as good of a rim protector and was a really good scorer from a shooting perspective. It wasn't a great uh, free throw shooter, but would pretty much did everything else statistically better. So it's not a given that this type of a of a, a transfer is going to work. But it was also clear in watching Peyton Sparks that like he was really struggling to adapt to the physical aspects of playing at this level. He looked really slow and and not very agile. So you hope in this case that that's not how things roll. We'll just have to wait and see. But you know, good job by Indiana. They knew they needed a backup big. They get the backup big. Now the question, and this has been debated quite a bit, is, well, okay, they're going to get somebody else with that 13th scholarship. I really don't think that they will. And I think the important thing to keep in mind is that you're really only going to play about 10 of these players. And, and if you look at the roster as it currently sits, it is, it's pretty full. You know, it is, it is a roster that has a bunch of players who are um, already, I think, 
in a position where you know what they're going to provide you, or at least we have a, a fairly good idea. Uh, so let me, I'm going to pop up the inside the whole um, scholarship chart. This is always informative so that we can take a look at this. So if you look at where IU is at right now in terms of their scholarship commitments for this upcoming year, they've got five players who would count as seniors or, or be in the last year of their eligibility or second last year of their eligibility. Hatton could potentially, I believe, have one more year, I think. Actually, I knew, I'm, now that I say that, I'm not totally sure. He may not. He may be one of the first post-COVID players. So let's just say those five would be set to graduate. You've got Malik Renew as a junior. You've got four sophomores, and you've got two freshmen. If you look at the players that are on the roster, it seems pretty clear that you're going to get major minutes out of Ballo, out of Renew. Um, you know, you've got Carlisle and Rice, who look like they're going to come in and play regularly. You've got Mbako, who was a starter pretty much all of last year. You've got Trey Galloway, who could start or could be a sixth man. You've got Luke Goody, who's going to come in and and play some significant minutes. And then you got a bunch of other plays. You got Bryson Tucker, the five-star freshman. You've got Ja'Kai Newton, who is coming off of injury, but people still expect some big things out of. You've got Gabe Cups. You've got Anthony Leal, who came on at the end of the year and uh, you know made quite a few contributions and played quite a bit. My point is, if you bring in a 13th player, they're just going to be sitting on the bench. And I don't, know, I don't think that's helpful to anybody, especially in this day and age. This is a bit of a different era, obviously, which we're going to talk about in a minute, from how college sports has operated before. And I think a lot of people, myself included, are still getting our heads wrapped around what that means, what the implications are for how you manage a roster. And I think it was a no-brainer to some degree, historically, that if you had an open scholarship, you would fill it with a project, you would fill it with you know, a, a maybe somebody who was coming off an injury. But what's the point at this point? I mean, if you look at what Indiana did in the portal, we had a lot of questions coming into this year about could Indiana play in the portal in a way that would allow them to reset large sections of their roster, and they did. And we'll have to see what that ha you know what, how that manifests itself on the floor, obviously. But in terms of player acquisition, IU did very well. I think the argument right now would be a who are you going to convince to come and take a 13th spot on the roster when you're probably only going to play nine guys, maybe 10. There just weren't a lot of teams that went much deeper than that that had any success last year. And in fact, a lot of the really successful teams only went truly like seven or eight deep. They had a couple of players who play like 10, 15 percent of minutes. But, you know, even Indiana at the end of the year had really shortened their rotation. So you're asking a player if they're good enough to play at this level, to come in and essentially not play for a year. And why would you do that in an era where you can transfer without penalty? Why wouldn't you just go somewhere else, play for a year, and say, you know what, Indiana or whoever, if that spot, if you really want me, that spot will be available next year, and I'll get a whole new year of development that I can apply to my game, and maybe I'll have better offers. Maybe I can make more money through NIL because I'll be a more valuable commodity. So I think to some degree, as much as people have said, well, Indiana needs another player because of, of inju you know, inju injury issues, I think at this point with the way the roster is constructed now, any injury that they suffer that would be that catastrophic would be to one of the bigs, and that just means that they would Indiana would have to play smaller. It looks like Indiana is going to play smaller anyway. I mean, the fact that they've only got really – you know, they've got the two bigs, and I would be surprised if they started both bigs and played them starters minutes the entire time. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if they went to a smaller lineup that had, you know, an Mbako at the four or Luke Goody at the four. Uh, you know, the, the idea that they're going to go and roll out with the same double big lineup, I just don't think they have the roster for it. And, and to me, this roster looks like a roster that's been redesigned to play a little bit quicker, a little bit smaller, a little more flexible. Um you're just you're asking a player to come in and essentially sit, and most players who are of the caliber that you would need to play at this level and contribute aren't going to do that, nor should they. So I think everybody is going to be playing these days, not just Indiana, but a bunch of different teams, on a little bit of a razor's edge, but that's basketball. I mean, you see that at the NBA level. You start to suffer a couple of injuries. You're not going to be able to just have infinite top guys to come off the bench, um, and Injuries are generally as much about luck as anything else. So that's not really a good reason to try to grab a 13th player and stick them on a scholarship that'll essentially just kind of have them sitting there wasted for a year. 
So I flip it around and I say to myself, here's, here's a situation where Indiana probably just stops at 12. And if they've got players that they're interested in, I would say go have those players go play at uh, a Missouri Valley level team or a Mid-American Conference level team or, or a Horizon League. Get a year's worth of playing because that's going to help their development curve more than sitting on the bench at Indiana and just practicing. It's a little bit of a different concept, but you know, to go to one of the questions that we got from, from Alex Graham, I heard Zach Osterman float the idea for a college basketball summer league to help transfers settle in. Thoughts? Well, my thoughts are, at, if you know, if Zach said that, I think it's a good idea. I think the whole concept, the whole paradigm of how American sports have operated over the course of time really needs to change. The, the weird thing about college sports in the U.S., They've been so dictated by the idea that it's, you know, it's amateur athletics, it's college athletics, that players don't get the opportunities to play the, you know, at the same, the same amount and at the same level as their counterparts in other countries. Uh, And that has become a big issue, I think, in terms of the development that American born players are getting from a skills perspective. Uh, across the board, like, you know, whether it's soccer or whether it's basketball, football doesn't really count because no one else plays football. But but even in baseball, I think you see a little bit of this issue because you've got this constricted amount of games that are being played at the college level. You think about it like a college team is playing 30 to 35 games a year uh, for basketball, soccer, it's it's less than that. And I do think that that combined with the lack of practice time that's afforded to you. You have limits on the amount of practice that the NCAA has historically provided, uh, again, to balance athletics and academics, has really created a bottleneck in terms of, of skill development, maybe not for the very top players, but certainly for the players that are in that second tier. So I am a firm believer that, it, you know, if, if we're going to, we have to stop looking at athletics as like, this thing that you do that you're not going to make a living off of. I mean, being a professional athlete, if you have that capability, is a legitimate profession. Uh, and it's something that it's always been this weird mentality in American sport that, you know, the, the NCAA had that famous ad, like, you know, we're you know 90 some percent of, of NCAA athletes are going to go pro in something other than sport. That's technically true, but that doesn't mean that we should not provide skill development opportunities and the ability to play in leagues for the players that are going to go pro. That's always been the problem with that equation. So a summer league, Alex, absolutely. And I would say combine that with removing some of the restrictions on practice time. Uh, you know, it, it, as we get further down the road here in terms of not just college basketball, but co- but like the whole concept of college sports, which we're going to talk about in a minute and how imperiled it's going to be financially. We have got to change our mentality in the United States about how we're developing athletes because the rest of the world has started to figure a bunch of stuff out and has gotten a lot more competitive in a lot of sports that America used to just dominate without thinking about. And it's because they're being very logical in the way that they do their drills, do their skills development, do their games. And we just haven't seen that out of... U.S. sport because it's still caught in this weird model where we think of college athletics as kind of the de facto professional league or the de facto end game for a lot of players. I think that's a real problem. So that's something to keep an eye on. But I I like the idea of the summer league. I think that's a good one. Um, Quick one here. Doug Gottlieb, (laughs) for those who didn't notice or didn't see this, Wisconsin Green Bay, or I guess they're just called Green Bay now, the Phoenix uh, in the, I believe they're still in the Horizon League. They hired Doug Gottlieb, uh, the the CBS Sports commentator, who's worked for ESPN and a bunch of other places as their head basketball coach. And apparently, they were really close to doing this last year. They ended up not. Um, Green Bay's coach leaves after one season and goes and takes the Wyoming job. So now Gottlieb is the head coach at Green Bay. The funky, there's two funky things about this. If you haven't seen the story, a Gottlieb is still going to be doing his radio show, which is two hours a day, while being the head coach. I got a sneaking suspicion that's not going to work out long term. Uh, that That is a lot to do, period. And how on earth do you negotiate like or navigate what he is supposed to talk about versus not talk about? I don't think that that's really realistic. So 
I, I will be shocked if he continues on with the radio show, although it's possible the radio show may last longer than his coaching career. This is a really weird hire. Um, and, and it's it strikes me how strange coaching is as a profession sometimes. And we're seeing this at the NBA level. Like there's a lot of buzz about J.J. Redick, who notably has not been a head coach, but has been you know a podcaster and has been working in media for a while, has been on ESPN. He was getting talked about as the Lakers coach. And I think they've backed off of that a little bit. Uh, but the, the it's always interesting. You know, we've seen we see this in coaching in general. We see it in the NFL. We've seen it in some we see it in the NBA quite a bit. Um, putting yourself in the public spotlight makes you so much more attractive to potential uh, team hires. It's it's a fascinating thing, and it goes to this whole idea of media and celebrity and you know, staying in the public eye as opposed to being kind of an up and coming younger coach. You know, it's fascinating to me the number of assistant coaches who have deserved a shot at a head coaching position somewhere who aren't getting that job. So that Doug Gottlieb, whose you know most notable coaching accomplishments been like coaching in the Maccabi games in in Israel and being the, the a radio host and and a, ta- a television talk show host that talks basketball on CBS, that that's the guy that you're going to hire as the head coach. It's, you know, could it work? Sure. I mean, we've seen stranger things happen in coaching, but it's just a weird profession that instead of going to, you know, any one of a number of on their face, logical selections among the assistant coaches or even the head coaches that are out there, you're zagging this much as, as, as uh, the green Bay's athletic department is. It's just a curious thing. I don't know like what the upshot is for green Bay. Cause it just, it seems very unlikely that Gottlieb who's been sitting there, he's 48 or 49 years old is going to have this second act as this great college coach. And, and this is going to be the starting point. I don't know. It's just, it seems like a really weird hire, but it's something that got talked about a lot earlier on this week. Anyway, um, a couple other items we wanted to hit. First of all, the house settlement. So for those who have not been paying attention, We've got a lot of stuff floating around right now about this, these lawsuits that are impending right now on the NCAA involving the payment of players. And, you know, it's, it's basically, if you look at House versus NCAA, um, the, the summary of this is essentially as follows. Um, the, the House case was brought by a former Arizona State swimmer. And it was filed in 2020, and it challenged the NCAA's name, image, and likeness compensation rules. A bunch of of players have joined this as a class action lawsuit. And, you know, we've been keeping an eye on this for a while because it's an interesting case in as much as um, the House case goes right to the heart of what the NCAA has restricted from athletes in terms of their ability to make money off of their name, image, and likeness. But what makes it interesting is that it's a bunch of athletes from the 2010s who are looking now at players making all of this money and they're saying, what the heck? Like, so, so this was actually allowed after all. And the NCAA just arbitrarily made a decision that they weren't going to allow it before this certain point and under threat, essentially from the, uh, from the Supreme court changed the rules. Well, a bunch of athletes are saying that's not right. We should be getting compensation uh, for all the NIL that we were not allowed to earn. What's been fascinating about this is this week we've seen a bunch of stories that have been published about an alleged settlement that may be getting talked about. Ross Dellinger of Yahoo Sports um, claimed that he had access to documents that showed officials from the NCAA and power conferences would potentially be looking at a $20 billion judgment against them if they didn't settle this case. Now, that on its face should make everybody kind of scratch their head. And this is where I think it's really important to keep in mind that the idea that there would be $20 billion in back settlement is really unlikely. You're talking about somewhere probably between two and $4 billion. That's still a lot of money, but $20 billion is one of those, like this is an existential threat to the entirety of college sports. And, and Dellinger's report went in even further and essentially claimed that you know, unless college sports got, you know, basically made a settlement, but got these concessions from the plaintiffs who are these athletes regarding getting help from Congress for an antitrust exemption and 
you know, uh, per some level of of opt in protection from future lawsuits. That you know, if they didn't settle, what would happen would be the NCAA would go bankrupt, and all of these college athletic departments would go bankrupt. And I just, first of all, I would highly recommend following other voices besides the traditional media voices that have been talking about this stuff. Because what often happens, and I think this was pointed out very adeptly by uh, Darren Heitner, who's uh, a friend of ours and, and writes a really good newsletter on name, image, and likeness called Newsletter Image Likeness on LinkedIn. You should go check it out. But as he noted, um, you know, there should be a lot of skepticism around this narrative. And Anytime you see these reports that the NCAA is supposedly, you know, trying to lock down the settlement, but that the plaintiffs are going to agree to help out with this antitrust exemption, or anytime you see these numbers floated around, it's the same thing that we've seen quite a bit, which is that reporters tend to go to athletic directors or college presidents, mostly athletic directors, and they'll get, you know, off the record quotes about what this could mean. And what ends up happening is that a lot of the off the record quotes are not verifiable, and they are grossly exaggerated, and they're done on purpose because they're trying to make it look like if someone doesn't save college sports from above, i.e. Congress, then college sports will go away, and it'll be replaced by something that nobody wants. That's that's a real problem in terms of the consumer because what ends up happening is the average consumer is not going to sit there and comb through all of the legalese and comb through all of the details and, and have a, a nuanced set of judgments regarding what's going on with the house case. They're just going to be like, oh, wow, I just read this thing from CBS Sports or from ESPN that says, you know, if, if there's no settlement here, that's $20 billion and everything's going to go bankrupt. So there needs to be this antitrust protection that comes down from Congress. Otherwise, we're going to lose college sports. It's like so much of that is wrong. And I think, you know, a lot of what is happening here is is simply a consistent attempt to try to control the public narrative, not to actually examine what's going on and come up with solutions or come up with suggestions about how this could go. There's a, you know, so much of this has been predicated on this idea that, that colleges and universities refuse to give up, which is this idea that athletes shouldn't be employees. And I know some of you in the audience don't think that they should be employees, and I, I understand why you feel that way, but they meet every definition of employee. And you take that further with name, image, and likeness and why this house case is such a big deal. So much of it comes down to this idea, as I talk about many times, these are rights every other college student has that college athletes had arbitrarily taken away from them by the NCAA. So the NCAA, having done that, is now trying to turn around and control the narrative about what athletes are or are not allowed to get. And it's like, you already did that. There's already a model in place for people being able to capitalize on name, image, and likeness. It's called the free market. There's already a, a, a system in place. I mean, what we've, been, what we've been hearing in this court case, as far as the settlement's concerned, is this idea that there'd be like $20 million every year. It would be essentially kind of like a salary cap that college athletic departments could that they don't have to, but they could use to compensate athletes. And you could kind of opt in or opt out to whatever level. And it's like, well, the the arguments that are being made in a lot of these stories through anonymous sources is that, oh, well, we'd have this cap, but there'd have to be a carve out that says that these aren't employees. That's like, th that's not necessary. There's already a model where you could have the athletes be employees and still compensate them. I, I mean, every professional sports league uses that model. That's it, there's, there's a collective bargaining aspect involved in that. So the reason I say all of this to you all, and the reason why I had to spend some time on it, is we continue to see stories pop up about how college athletic directors or presidents feel. There was an article the other day about how you know uh, SEC presidents, some of them just want collective bargaining. Some of them think, oh, we should go to court and fight. I mean, so much of it is predicated on the idea that the like this $20 billion amount is actually real or that any of the details of this supposed settlement that are leaking out are actually accurate. I don't think that they are. They really do seem to be more based upon this idea that the NCAA is trying again to control the narrative because they really don't want athletes to be deemed employees and that's it. So just be cautious if you are getting involved at all in reading about this stuff and trying to figure out what's going on. My advice would be 
to focus on what the lawyers around the case are saying, not what's being quoted in a lot of these articles, because the articles, frankly, don't seem to have a good bead on what's actually going on with the case. Anyway, um, reader questions. We had a couple of extra reader questions I wanted to get to. Uh, our old friend Michael Tilka asks, what do you think of the IU football Northwestern situation for this year's game, tickets, venue, et cetera? I'm really, I'm really pissed about this. I got to be honest. Um, when I heard, first of all, for those who don't know, Northwestern football is renovating their football stadium. Um, and so it's closed. They've torn the bleachers down. So there was a, there was talk for a while that Northwestern was going to split its home games between the Chicago Fire Stadium in Bridgeview and Soldier Field for the really big games. And the Indiana Northwestern game was supposed to be at Bridgeview. And I was really excited about that. I, I know that stadium well. I've been to multiple games there. Uh, it would have been a perfect size. I think it's something like 20, 25,000 people. Um, it would be, you know, for an Indiana Northwestern game, that would be a nice, cool, intimate, kind of older school way to play that game. Is that what's happening? No. Instead, Northwestern's decided they're going to play their games on their practice field, which is right next to Lake Michigan. Uh, I think they're going to have temporary bleachers of like 10 or 12,000 seats. I have no clue what the ticket situation for that's going to be, but that sounds like uh, a disaster. Uh, and it's it's one of those things where if I happen to come into a ticket, I would probably go um, just because I would love to be there to experience what that looks like. But I, anytime you're playing on a non-traditional surface, I have I have a problem with like the potential negative aspects of that from a competition perspective. And you know, I it's disappointing because I think that's a game that's winnable for Indiana. But that's likely going to be a really weird place to play a game, uh, especially I think the practice field is right next to Lake Michigan. So you're going to have a lot of unpredictable wind gusts and things of that nature. Um, maybe it will be the coolest thing ever. Maybe it will be like a glorified high school game, which certainly Northwestern Indiana over the course of time, we've had plenty of those uh, in terms of how the game has gone. But I was really looking forward to a slightly less intimate venue uh, but still one that would have a smaller crowd that would be easy for ticketing and to get to and whatnot. This does not sound like it. Maybe I will have my mind changed, but I'm I'm a little bit skeptical, I guess I'll say at this point. Um, another question from uh, NJ Myers. Why don't we have a men's basketball NCAA game like football that is coming? So for those who missed it yesterday, pre-order drop for the college football game from EA. Um, I will say one thing on that first. Be very careful about the pre-order. I am the fact that a they've bundled this with Madden and b they've already got like the ultimate team stuff and like the EA points. The the biggest fear, the two biggest fears I guess about this college football game are a that it's going to play bad, which is always a possibility with EA because frankly EA's football games have gotten pretty bad over the course of time. But B, that they're going to fill it with microtransactions because if you are at all familiar with video games, that's how that's how EA and a lot of these companies make a lot of their money. Uh, microtransactions and, you know, you don't get the full experience unless you're buying like special player packs and things like that. Uh, I am really concerned about how much of the game is playable and enjoyable versus how much of the game is reliant on those sorts of things. So just keep an eye out on that. Now, the, the question about why we're not getting a basketball game, the last NCAA basketball game was, I believe, the EA Sports game that came out in 2010. That was a game that only existed because EA had bought the exclusive rights for college basketball. Uh, it used to be that there was an EA game and then a 2K sports game, and the 2K sports games were far superior, in my opinion. But we haven't had a, a college hoops 2K game since... 2007. You know, it was the 2K8 title, but it came out in 2007. So it's been 17 years. Unfortunately, college basketball just doesn't have the same level of public purchasing interest that college football does. It, it's easy to forget, since we haven't had the game in a decade, just how popular college football the video game was. I mean, it wasn't as popular as Madden. Madden's really kind of a global phenomenon. But College football is really, really a popular game. Never popular enough to like be the flagship, but far more popular than the college basketball game was. And I think, you know, unfortunately, when you when you look at the video game industry, there's just, you know, most of those big AAA level developers like EA, 
they're just not going to spend all of the money on a development cycle for a game like college basketball that isn't going to have a huge built-in audience. There's a nice niche audience that's interested, but the fact that nobody's tried to step up and make a college basketball game, um, and even the fact that you know, you've know really only got one pro basketball game, and, and that's kind of atrophied over the course of time as well, uh, it gives you an indication. And, and look, ultimately, I mean, I've been playing – uh, video games, sports games for a long time. Basketball just doesn't play quite as well as football does. And I think that hurts the popularity. Now, I love the college basketball. I still play College Hoops 2K8. I've got like three different copies of it. I can play on different uh, systems. So that this is me as someone who does like playing basketball in video game form, telling you that basketball just doesn't translate quite as well. Um, and so that I think is an overriding concern for the publishers down the line, is it possible we could get a college basketball game back? I mean, it's possible, but it would really, I think probably have to come from 2k who already has a basketball game and they'd have to port quite a bit down from NBA 2k to the college game. And even then I just don't know that there would be enough people to buy the game that it would really matter. So that's the reason why it's a little bit disappointing, but that's how it goes. Uh, had a question on football. Can we provide a great, a quick breakdown on priority points? A lot of us de- getting season tickets for the first time. Um, priority points at IU. Um, I mean, if you're buying basketball tickets, they matter in terms of where you're selecting seats. They matter a little bit with football. The thing is with football, there a lot of the seats are very similar, I think, in quality. So you're not getting a huge bump with your priority points. But the, the thing about priority points is if you buy season tickets every year, if you're making varsity club donations, they can add up. They can help with, you know, if, if you're the if you want to get a parking spot around the stadium, you have to get enough priority points to get to that level. Um, you know, but a lot of it I from my experience as a season ticket holder for both football and basketball, most of the benefits come in basketball where seat location is so much more important than it is in football. So I would just say Congrats. If you are purchasing football season tickets, I will see you at the stadium this year. And, you know, just if you're planning on doing it, just keep doing it every year. Don't skip a year because you will lose your priority points if you do. Uh, Last question, and we'll wrap up here from Jordan Bailey. Indy 500 qualifying this weekend. Who are we rooting for and who do we want pumped? This is a tough one. I I was thinking about this the other day. I'm in a weird spot with IndyCar right now, to be frank, because it's been kind of a weird year. I don't, it has, you know, with the Penske stuff and the the first few races haven't been that exciting. Uh, I don't really have strong feelings one way or another uh, for most of the people that are in the field this year. Uh, and then that isn't to say that I I'm rooting against or for anybody. It's just that I'm, I'm not really fired up about a lot of what I'm seeing in the driver list. Like I'm looking right now, practice session four, you know, speeds are down. I guess they're adding horsepower for, for qualifying. The rain has not helped. We haven't seen a lot of of track time for cars. I mean, I feel like, you know, I've, I've gotten to the point with my IndyCar watching where I enjoy watching the really good teams do what they do. So I I'm, you know, I think in the back of my mind, I'd, I'd love to see a you know, Pato Award or Alex Pillow do well in this race. I'm not really rooting for anybody to get bumped per se. It's a it's a weird feel. I mean, if you look at the speeds, on you know, shockingly, Stingray Rob has been the the slowest of the of the drivers out there. Um, but you know, you look at that list of of drivers towards the bottom, and it, they're all kind of in a cluster. There's a lot of rookies down at the bottom, as one might expect, including Kyle Larson, which. I think has been a little bit of a surprise to people, but I don't know. Overall, when I look at the field, it, you know, I would, I, I'm not rooting for either of these guys to get bumped, but given the back and forth and, and kind of the, the silly banter and uh, almost like faux outrage, it would be interesting if it was Santino Ferrucci versus uh, Romain Grosjean, uh, you know, trying to bump each other out of the field at the end. I think that would be kind of a funny uh, solution to things, but I doubt that's going to happen. I think both cars will get it in safely. And uh, if Stingray Rob is not the one that gets bumped, I'll be a little bit surprised. So hopefully we just get good enough weather for qualifying to last the whole day on Saturday. That would be ideal given how things have gone so far. That's probably not going to happen, but we'll see. Anyway, uh, this went pretty long, but good to talk with you all once again. 
And hopefully you all have a great weekend. Uh, Scott and I will be back. We'll be talking IU basketball. We'll talk some IndyCar. We'll do some other items. We'll have a VIP video coming up this weekend. Thanks to Home Field Apparel. Thanks to our friends at the Back Home Network. Should have some new programming coming up on the Back Home Network soon that you will enjoy. For all those people, I'm Galen Clavio. Thanks for joining us on Crimson Cast. We'll catch you folks on the flip side. Bring back the bison. So long, everybody.